Hello and welcome along to another edition of Beyond the Boundary. It's a very special edition as well. We're delighted to say that I've got uh, sitting alongside me Mike Brearley, former England captain and, uh, well, eminent psychoanalyst as well, author. And the reason Mike is here, not just to watch Middlesex play Lancashire, Middlesex's old county, of course, but to promote his uh, new book, Turning Over the Pebbles, which is a memoir uh, about life and cricket and the mind. Yes, yes. So, Michael, really good to see you. Good to be here. Um, Thank you, Paul. Emirates Old Trafford has changed dramatically mm -hmm. since your mm -hmm. time as a player. Mm -hmm. First impressions? I remember playing here for Cambridge University against Lancashire, and we were, of course, playing, uh, changing in the pavilion, mm -hmm. square onto the mm -hmm. pitch as it was, and Slacky Hilton was bowling. He was fast. He was fast. I'd never seen anything like it. I, I, I think he twisted an ankle or something before I went into bat, but he was quick. Mm. Anyway, that was, so that's one memory, the first memory. But I came to Old Trafford a few times. I can't remember ever scoring any runs here. There was quite an enjoyable test match when Ian Botham scored 118 in 86 balls, I see, mm. recorded on one of the pavilion walls. And... Um, and that was the third of those remarkable matches in, in 1981. It was your first test match. It was. And you got six wickets. I got four, four wickets. Four wickets. And you um, scored 50. Unbelievably. Wonderful. I've never scored a 50 in any Wonderful. class of cricket. Well, in Wonderful. any senior class of Wonderful. cricket. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. I do remember, <laughs> I, I, I obviously remember a lot about that game, but I remember being in awe of you because your uh, reputation went before you as a captain. Um, and... I also remember you making me feel uh, r remarkably calm um, at obviously the most nervous time of my career. Yeah. Well, I'm glad about that. I probably wasn't calm myself, but it's like a s swan paddling under the water. <laughs> well, it was a frantic, it, it was a frantic experience, I mm. think, because mm. of what had gone before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just start a little bit with that, yes. because that 81 series... Yes. Um, is perhaps the one that you'll be most remembered for as captain. Coming back to captain the side, uh, England were one nil down, and England then won three matches on the trot with you at the helm. Same players, more or less. Yes, I mean, that but very, very lucky as well as great turnaround of, of Ian Botham and to some extent Bob Willis too, who mm. got eight wickets at Headingley, mm. two tests before this one. Mm. Um, no, but. but, but at the time, I think, we knew, I knew perfectly well that it was a hair's breadth and it was very lucky that we won, but we did and it was remarkable and it captured the imagination of a lot of people in the country at that time. Coming to the book quickly, um, it, it's a memoir yes, uh, and uh, it is about your life from your time as a schoolboy right the way through university as a lecturer and then mm -hmm. your cricket career mm -hmm. and then post cricket mm -hmm. career as, mm -hmm. a, as a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that struck me in the book was that you said that cricket is a part of me. Mm. You didn't mention that any, any other aspect mm -hmm. of your career or life is a part of you, but cricket is mm -hmm. a part of you. Why, why is that so fundamental to you? Well, I think, it, for one thing, it's the, f it's the first thing I really remember. Cricket, and, and at that time, football was equal. Winter mm -hmm. was football, cricket was mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. um, when I was little, and my dad was a good cricketer. He played for Yorkshire once and Middlesex twice, and both their second 11s, you know, Yorkshire were the best county in the country. He played with Len Hutton and Herbert Sutcliffe in a mm -hmm. match against Middlesex, actually. Mm -hmm. Heretic, <laughs> Heretic Head Hedley. Hedley Verity, yeah, yeah. and Bill Bowes, and Compton and Edrich. So it was quite a match, you know. Mm. So it, it, it got my imagination. I loved it. I wanted to play cricket all the time. When I was about nine, I put it in the book, my mother said to me, if you carry on like this, you'll do nothing but play cricket and football all your life, <laughs> which is a bit yeah. true. <laughs> well, there are worse things to do. And I there suppose. were many worse things to do. And so I think it was ingrained in me. You know, my dad was a Yorkshireman. He played in Yorkshire League and for Leeds University and the British Universities and then he played for Yorkshire Seconds and so on. And they all thought about cricket uh, from a point of view of tactics and strategy as well as about technique and 
what shots you should play and what shots you shouldn't play. There's a, there's a lovely little uh, bit in the book about your upbringing, or your father's upbringing, yes. really, and the way he approached the game yes. as a serious game. Yes, that's no, right. no fripperies. No fripperies. Uh, had to be Ser played properly. And straight, and straight, you know. Yeah, straight, play straight. I mean, straight technically, but Technic straight yeah. morally as well, according yeah. to the values of the time, really. And yet you were an innovator when in your time at, at yeah. cricket, in, in many aspects, weren't you? Well, um, you, yes. you were the first, I think, maybe the second to wear a helmet yes. for a start, yes. or a skull cap, and, and, as they were called then. And within six months, everyone was wearing them, except Viv Richards. Yeah, well, Viv, <laughs> yeah, Viv never... No. Yeah. I only ever saw... I saw Clive Lloyd take a helmet off once when he was facing Sylvester Clark. Did he? And I asked him many well, years later, yeah. so why did he do that? He said, I felt I just needed sharpening up a little. And did he? <laughs> <laughs> Sylvester. Mm, he, he was, was quite a bowler, wasn't he? He was rapid, yeah. yeah. Um, but... Interestingly, um, you, you obviously, as I said, were an innovator. Um, fancy fields your father didn't like. I think he said fancy fields or field placings. What do you make of the field placings and the modern game? Yeah. Uh, well, you can't say in general, yeah. but uh, the way the game has evolved. Well, I think it's evolved quite a bit in the last year and a bit, especially uh, with Ben Stokes joining, joined by Brendan McCullum. And Brendan McCullen, I think, shifted the game on in the mid 1910s, 1913, 15, and beyond, mm. for when he captained New Zealand. Uh, and I think he did, you mentioned just before we started the one day match, uh, 50 over matches, but in, in the World Cup in 2015. Yes. Mm. But I think in Test cricket too. Mm. And in two ways. One is that they, he, having been. I think depressed actually, or low, and mm. losing the point of what cricket was about, and feeling the New Zealand team had, had done the same thing. He's, he tried to get people back to playing as they had with the same mentality, similar mentality, to what they had played in as a child when they started playing cricket just for love, love of the game. Remember the age, remember the innocence with the which innocence. you played the game. And then you can, he said, then you can look for what you hope to do and might do and not be too preoccupied with how things will go wrong. And I think he helped the English team to transform into an attitude that they shared through the whole, they are sharing still through mm -hmm. the whole team, the whole squad, of being able to take a few more risks, to go for things in a natural way, be a bit more relaxed about it and so on. Is that something that you did yourself when you were captain? Well, I think I did with some people. I think I did with Ian Botham and his batting when he when he came back, because he'd got you know he he was very unlucky. You know, he might have had a Stokes if he'd had a different set of teams to play against, mm. because of his eleven matches as captain. I think it was eight or nine were against the West Indies, mm -hmm. who were easily the best team in the world at the mm -hmm. time. Then and then Australia, the other two, mm -hmm. they were the next best team, and we mm -hmm. were probably the one after that. And, uh, you know, that was really bad luck. But he had lost his form, both as a bowler and as a batsman, during that time. And I think he needed to... But it, it, it's quite... Uh, still amazes me yeah. that he was at such a low yeah. after the, the Lord's Test yeah. when, when he resigned or was going to be removed, yes, or whichever both, way it was, yeah, both yeah, probably. Yeah. And yet, almost instantly, because it was the next Test match, he became... Yet again, this talismanic figure. D did you say anything to him? Well, you must have done. We only met in between those times on the lunchtime or the afternoon, the day before the test, as you did in those days. Yeah. And I was a little nervous, you know, how was he going to be? I thought uh, we'd always got on. Mm. Uh, very because different you'd people. Him, but you'd known him for five for years, quite a while. four yeah. or five years. Yeah. But I still felt, was he, how bitter was he going to be? How negative would he be about anything? Mm. You know, about was he happy that, that it was me and not somebody else? I think he was, actually, because mm -hmm. mm. he knew me and we got on. And, and I could give him his head, but sometimes I could just take him off or say, I'm not going to bowl you if you bowl medium pace half volleys, which I did during that match. Oh, took yeah. him off after three overs. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't like it, but we could get through over that. But batting-wise, I think the luck was 
that it was such a good pitch to bowl on. We let them get 400 in the mm. first innings. Mm. We were, when he came into bat, probably 100 for five or something like that, or maybe 80, I don't know, I can't remember. Mm. And he played a big shot against Dennis Lilly, and it was a good good length, just short of a length ball, and Lilly's usual line just outside off stump, mm. going away, and it reared up. He was trying to hit it off the back foot. It reared up, just missed his gloves and his chin, and went through to Rodney Marsh like that. And he looked up to me. I was sitting in the balcony, which was quite close to the mm. pitch in square those on. days, yeah. square on, mm. long leg really, but mm. square on. Mm. And he, I sort of said, enjoy yourself, you know, carry mm. on, because on that pitch I knew, probably on any pitch at that time, but on that pitch in particular, he was better off playing, playing all the shots he, he felt like playing. And yet I do seem to remember that when he got his 100, there was a, there was a camera shot of you, which I've seen subsequently, yeah. of, you, of you saying, keep going. Yes. basically. Don't, well, uh, yes. But that's the Don't, same thing. Uh, it was the same thing, really. I didn't want him to stop playing shots, but I just thought he's got to 100, and I think um, it was when Chris Old had come in as well, and, and how was Chris going to play? Mm. He got at 29. He played mm. oh, 27, 29. They put mm. on probably 60-odd, mm. which is also crucial, like your 50, <laughs> 52. In the first... Uh, 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 oh, that was the latest... That was at Old Trafford. I'm sorry, yeah. Old Trafford. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it was... So, um, I did, and I, I think... That's on the, the BBC programme of highlights of the Test match, that gesture from me. Mm. And I was given credit by Richie Benno saying that I was saying, carry on, hitting to, to Chris Old. But I think I was also saying to Chris Old, you know, keep that left foot, his back foot, somewhere in line with the stumps. <laughs> well, he was, <laughs> yes, he was quite good at giving himself a little giving room. Giving himself a little room. As we, yeah, yeah. But actually, he, he did very well as well in that. Mm. In that match and in that stand, he also bowled, in the second innings, he bowled seven overs for ten runs and got Alan Border out just mm. after lunch. Mm. And then um, Ray Bright slogged him for a couple of fours from straight to square leg. But he'd done a good job too. Mm. So, Where did you, how long did it take you to learn your approach to captaincy? Because you also say in the book that captaincy was very important to you in your future career. It, it wasn't the fact that philosophy or psychoanalysis yeah. helped yeah. your captaincy. It was much the other way around, really. As mu at least as much, I agree with you. Um, well, I think it's that, you know, there are two main branches of captaincy. One is t tactics and strategy and putting the right people on the right sort of fields and mm -hmm. deciding when to declare and all that sort of thing. Mm. But the other is something more intangible, which is to do with how do you get the best out of the team, both individually and as a whole. And I suppose it was, I'm not saying I could always do it very well, but I, it was always an issue, you know, and there were always one or two people who would be a bit difficult, to, from my point of view, in different ways. I would be difficult for them too, mm. by the way. Mm. But, but how did you get the best out of people? And I think one of the lessons that I sort of partly learned, partly from Ray Illingworth talking to Raymond, because I always like to talk to Raymond, but he said about taking Jon Snow to Australia in 1971, mm -hmm. when we won. Mm -hmm. And he decided that with Jon Snow, he said to Jon Snow, look, until the first test, the key bowler, I want you, uh, you're going to do what everyone else does in the way of practice and so on, turn up to the nets and really try and put every, get yourself fully fit. Mm -hmm. After that time, if all's going well, it's up to you. You tell me when you want to practice, you tell me when you want to play. In other words, to start with, the rules are the same for you as for everyone else. But once we get into the test cricket, and I want you to be fit for test matches, that's what I want, mm. you do it your way. Mm. And I sort of admired that. And I think the rest of the team could buy into that, that he was being treated differently from others. Mm -hmm. A bit of that was true of Ian, but sometimes with Ian, it was, I had to say to him, no, you've got to bowl. Before you, before we go and play a match, you know, bowl a bit, and then he'd come and bowl bounces at me in the nets, amusing <laughs> <laughs> himself. Well, yeah, I mean, he was he was a, a rule to himself, but he as was. you say, he needed he needed managing, and he you did. managed him he did. managed him ab admirably. Um, do you think you'd enjoy captaining the present day England side? Yes, under under McCullum yes. and Rob Key. And what I think I'd have loved it. I'd have loved it because that seems well, to be exactly what you're, you're talking about. Yes, now. I'm, I'm afraid uh, I couldn't buy into it for myself. But, but no, but 
because I still remain tense and uptight. <laughs> well, and you say in the book you were, you know, before your first game of cricket in, at school, you were sick. You, you yeah. felt sick, too sick to play. Yes. Yeah. And also your test match. The second think. test match, the first one at Lords was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. quite, but I mean, at least you can appreciate how the others feel then, of course. Well, I think there's something experience. in that. that mm. You know, the people, people who've, who are really the geniuses of the game are not always the best captains, you know, because mm. they haven't had to go through the things that the rest of us have to go through, from, mm. certainly from time to time. And it's always a, a bit of a struggle at the top level. I think by the end of my career, I got to feel I belonged in county cricket. You know, I was a yeah. good county cricketer. Yeah. I was on the edge of being a, a test player. I mean, I got selected as a batsman. But well, you played 39 times. Yes, but many of them because I was captain. But, yeah. but still, as a batsman, I'm thinking of. So, yes. How? No, no, because um, yeah. it's interesting um, to me, and I, I'm sure to, to people who want to get to know you or fe feel they want to get to know you. You were captain for 39, uh, sorry, captain for 31 of those yes. 39 tests. Yes. Did it ever... Not dawn on you, perhaps, but did it trouble you that you weren't contributing as a batsman? And how did you equate that? Yeah. And how did that make you feel yeah. compared to the greats who were around you, the yeah. Bothams, the Willises, the Boycotts, the Underwoods, etc. Gower, of yeah. course, yeah. In, his, yeah. in his pomp. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. How do you come to terms with that? Well, sometimes with difficulty, mm. Paul. I mean... There were good things that people said to you. I remember Tony Gregg captaining when I was vice-captain in India and the first test match I was in really good form and it was a good pitch. We won the toss, lovely day, mm. and I ran myself out for five. And he told me later that match, during the match, that he felt like crying when I ran myself out. You know, So that was kind of a... Mm. And Ian Botham would say to me once or twice, I might have scored a slow 20, but the ball was doing a bit and... And there were some good bowlers, you know. So there's this reciprocal feeling of was, people wanting you to do well. Yes, uh, good players wanting yes, you to do well. And, and, and valuing the contribution, even if in, in ordinary statistical terms it was modest. Mm. Well, it was modest, but it was still something. Yeah. And, and there were once or twice when I really was in bad form. I mean, there was once after I'd broken my arm. And I came back that too soon. Pakistan. That was in Pakistan. I came back too soon the next summer. It was quite a bad break, and anyway, I, I couldn't. It was not good, hmm. and um, I got to the last test at, oh, I think it was at um, Nottingham against New Zealand, and I scored fifty uh, against Hadley and and New Zealand, and they, all the team came out on the balcony to to applaud, and it was at a time when it was going to be selected for the winter, mm -hmm. the team. Mm -hmm. And, and that meant a lot to me, mm. you know, because they obviously wanted me to play. And then once in Australia, when I couldn't score a run, they, uh, I, I asked them, Doug Insole and Bob and uh, probably Jeffrey Boycott, and, and they all said, you know, you've got to keep playing. We want you there. And so that was a... So I did need some support from people yeah. like that. You mentioned... <coughs> you, you talk a bit about your, your nerves and your, your approach to cricket. Do you get nervous in other aspects of your life? In, for instance, when yeah. you started as a, a philosophy lecturer yeah. in, at Newcastle yeah. University, you were, yeah. you were relatively young and yeah. you had time away from the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then beginning your psychoanalysis training. No, Did you... I, I'm afraid I do. Um, but that's good then. Well, it's a got a good side to it. You've mm. got to be anxious a bit. I mean... Mm. Even someone, I remember Ian Botham saying to me, he was really anxious it, before a test match until he walked onto the field. Yeah. But mine didn't stop when I walked onto the field. But, you know, he, he, it was his You stage. didn't stop when you went on the field? No. I well, mean, as a batsman or as, as a captain? As a batsman. Captain. As a captain, I, I was more confident. Yeah. Um, I had those doubts that you mentioned, you know. Was I worth a place in the team? Mm. Was I wanted by the team? Was I contributing enough in that way to make up for not contributing it as much as I'd like in, as mm. a batsman? Um, but I did, and I, you know, I can have um, still. I think psychoanalysis has helped me in this, and cricket too, probably. Mm. I can still feel a bit of a panic in the night if something's going to happen that's difficult the next day, giving a paper to a distinguished audience mm. or that sort of thing. Mm. Um, or sometimes with again, as with. People you find difficult in your ordinary emotional interactions, 
whether it's a patient or a player, you know, it can be the same mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm. But I, I hope it's a bit easier than it was. You, you talk about, um, in the book, about obviously various aspects of your life. Um, and there's one, one particular part where you, you almost wonder whether you could have done other things, i.e. stayed in cricket as a mm -hmm. coach yes. or a yeah. commentator yes. or a writer, and you yeah. do write about, yeah. about the game. Come back to the writing. Yeah. Come, yeah. Um, or whether you've explored the path that you wanted to explore. Yeah. In other words, yeah. carry on with your, your learning, basically, yeah. and, and, and this profession of, of psychoanalysis. Well, I do find psychoanalysis fascinating. You know, it's the whole person. It's men and women. Well, of course, cricket is for women as well, mm. but we, we didn't have... Didn't quite have we, it in we our day, did play, we? And we didn't play alongside them, no. of course. No. So, um, and it's the whole person, and it's from childhood on, and it's, it's, it, that's the point of the matter, whereas in cricket it was really, how do you get the best out of people and help them in relation to their cricket? Sometimes that may be helping them in other ways. Hmm. I remember... Steve Waugh saying to me once, I think I put it in the book too, saying that he wanted, he hoped as captain of Australia to help people to become not only better cricketers but better people. And I think that was a very interesting comment. But I thought the whole, so in a way that's the, you know, it, it covers the whole range of the unconscious and conscious self, the mind, the emotions, the behaviour, the inclinations, the dreams. I think it's, it's suited me very well actually. Mm. But you do come back to yeah. what you most most enjoyed about the game and the yeah. companionship, yes. the dressing the, room, the humour, which yeah. you, which you, st I think not you, but we all struggle to come to terms with yeah. when we finish I playing so. the game because you're that it's a twenty four seven occupation it as is. a cricketer. It is, and I think a lot of players find it very very difficult in those those first years out of the game. I think so too, and it is difficult, and and for me, and it, we have to stop in our thirties or at 40 mm. or whatever, start I stopped again. at 40 and start again in something else. And mm. for, for many people that's, that's quite difficult. Mm. I mean, it wasn't easy for me, but it was, I had something that I was kind of had in mind and was moving towards. So that was quite important. So you, you I was you lucky. Well, yeah, but in luck, part. right yes. place at right time. Absolutely. Luck plays a part. Richie Benno, of course, said, yeah. don't, try, don't try don't try captaincy without the luck. Yes, but don't try catching it without the ten percent of skill you said, well, didn't you? That is true. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's an interesting thing about everyone's life is how much is luck and how much do we create our own luck or mm. or make the most of it or the worst of it. Mm. You know, so I I agree with you. It's a complicated combination. So, Mike, we're coming coming towards the end of, yeah. of, of your time uh, of your time here. Yeah. Um, where do you think? you've been most happy? Is it in the dressing room or in the psychoanalyst's room talking to somebody on the, on, on the couch or chair or whatever? Well, I think most happy in, the, in any obvious sense of the word is when teams have been doing well, I've been doing okay myself and there's been a great spirit in the team as there was in that team you joined mm. and in Middlesex over the last few years of my playing. Uh, and um, I think I was as happy as uh, in any sort of work situation that spread to the rest of one's life that I could be. Um, psychoanalysis is a bit different. It's not so much fun because people are coming for a serious, mm. usually serious or at least problems in their life and things they want to address. And, but it's not, it's not all misery either. And people can have, you know, jokes can be helpful or humour can be helpful in that But too. you'll gain uh, gratification from being able to help them, yes. presumably. Yes. In the same way as you yes. would get that as a captain of a cricket team, helping yes. individuals to succeed. And alongside that, there's a satisfaction of seeing something more clearly yourself, whether it's as a batsman, you know, playing the right strokes and building an innings and having a good run of the, with the mm. bat and that sort of thing, or also thinking in a good, clear way with the patient and not being too disrupted in one's thought or in a bad mood or <laughs> you know, negative. I know. Well, no, but you, you do say that through the book, you, your captaincy was all, you always felt was positive and your approach to cricket was always positive. And I think that, mm. that well, stands the so. test of time. It does, yeah. certainly. Yeah. 
Mike, the book is a is a, a really good read. It's a challenging read for, for me, um, so. but it's a, a lovely mem memoir. Thank you. Um, and uh, I wish you all the success with it. Yes, and turning over the pebbles is is one of the chances of being a psychoanalyst is you have a chance to look at things a second time round yeah. in your life and as a as the analyst too. And I think it's quite that's something that's fascinated me. You look at something and you get a second bite of the cherry is another phrase one might use. I like the phrase. Can I use one more phrase now before we stop? There was a psychoanalyst who said of one, one patient, it was fascinating how boring that patient was. And there's, a, there's a, you see, he didn't just stay bored. He was interested, well, why am I so bored? Is it me? Is it him? him? Is, yeah. it, is it, what, and if it's him, what's it to do with? You know, so something about that too. Well, Mike, you've certainly had a, a, a fulfilled and, and varied life, and, yeah. and that's yeah. very well portrayed in the book. So thank, thank you very much for thank talking you. to me. Thank you, Paul.